Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in week 5 of the Ramesh Sonny Balwani Theranos trial. As a reminder, Balwani is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranos. He was co-accused with Elizabeth Holmes, whose trial finished in January this year, and she was found guilty on four counts of fraud and conspiracy to defraud investors. Balwani's trial is being held separately due to claims of abuse that Elizabeth Holmes made against him in her trial, and this is week five of his trial. So as a reminder, we had Mark Pandori on the witness stand last week. He was the former lab director and spent about six months with Theranos in late 2013 into 2014. He was a prosecution witness and had already testified about problems with the lab tech and Balwani's adverse reaction when told that the Edison device needed more R&D. It was then the defence's turn and Stephen Cesaris of Orrington for the defence reviewed a February 2014 email Balwani wrote to Pandori and others that copied Holmes in. And in this Balwani said he was extremely irritated by people within the company with no legal background taking legal positions and interpreting the data from the proficiency test. Balwani said they should never have been run because the company had alternative assessment procedures for the Edison device because it was different from other blood testing machines. Now towards the end of the day, Cesaris reviewed an email with Pandori and the email was sent on the last day that Pandori was at the company and this was May 2014 and had an attachment with the title Transition Report. So the first response that Pandora gave was I don't recall doing that, and Cesaris kept pressing him. He repeated his denial about four more times when asked in different ways about the email. Eventually, he did make the comment when asked if it were possible he wrote it. He said, it is possible. Now, so don't forget this was late Friday, and Cesaris asked if he could speak separately with the judge who then sent the jury home. Oh dear, Judge de Villa was not very happy. Why are we wasting time? asked the judge. We had 17 minutes left and surely, surely you could have touched on another subject and come back to this. I had to send the jury home and it's unfortunate. So one of the other lawyers for Balwani said that the document being brought into evidence was important because under the government's direct examination, Pandora had testified he'd been excited to join the company but quit six months later citing several concerns including the accuracy of the startup's blood analysing device. This is the tail end of that said Geoffrey Cooper Smith of Oric. This is the informing issue of why he left. De Villa said, it is not now known if the memo is actually Pandora's own words. And Cooper Smith responded by telling the court that in the end the former lab director had hedged a little bit by saying that he didn't have a memory of the document. Now the judge challenged that assertion. You repeated the question again and again and again. And we know what witnesses do, Judge De Villa said. They'll yield. They'll say, yeah. It's possible. John Bostick for the government told the judge that under a stipulation between the parties, documents stored and produced by Theranos are admissible, but only if there are no issues with authenticity. And in response, Cooper Smith for Bowani said there were numerous ways to authenticate the email. It was given to the government by Theranos and was numbered in such a way that it showed it was one of the documents stipulated for admission. Here's the bottom line, he said. If this document doesn't come in from Dr. Pandori, we'll do this the hard way. We'll have a paralegal lined up from the US Attorney's Office about what they received from Theranos. Oh dear. Late on a Friday, this did not go down well with Judge de Villa. He cut Cooper Smith off. Don't threaten me, you're better than that, he said. The judge then wrapped up for the afternoon saying he would look at the transcript and stew on this. So early Tuesday morning, when the court resumed after the weekend, the defence had filed a motion to include new documents relating to that Pandora email. The defence were very apologetic and contrite in doing so, but clearly the judge was in a better mood. No, 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 Judge de Villa said. To quote Emerson, finish each day and be done with it. You have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. So that's what we'll do. So first up in the witness box on Tuesday was ex theranus controller Sohan Spivy, who goes by the name Denise Yam. 
She was the first witness to testify in the Holmes trial, and I guess we'll see Mark Pandori again when the issues with the questionable email or documents are resolved one way or another. So about Jan, we saw a similar set of questions for her as we did in the Holmes trial, and the link to the video from the Holmes trial with her testimony should be just about here. We heard she joined Theranos in 2006. She reported at that time to the then CFO and was laid off in 2017, and by then she was actually the highest ranking finance team member and reported directly to Holmes. We heard that Balwani regularly asked her for financial information, and here again we see that Balwani is taking a direct role in operational aspects relating to the running of the company. Yam says that Ernst & Young audited Theranos financials between 2006 and 2008, and then KPMG conducted an audit in 2009 and 2010, but it couldn't complete its report because there was an issue. KPMG thought Theranos undervalued options given to Elizabeth Holmes and some Theranos employees. Now I believe that I'd read that Balwani was one of the employees that had been given options at an undervalue, and it was his options that caused the financial statements not to be signed off. Well this point certainly widens that issue, and I'll look back at my notes and see if I can find any reference to the original source for it being just Balwani. Anyway, Balwani's counsel, by the way, was making objection after objection to the questions being asked of Yam. Uh, eventually, we got to the point that she thought it was unusual for Theranos not to have an outside auditor audit the company's financial statements annually after 2008. And I can vouch for that personally. It would be almost unheard of for a company of that size with so many external investors not to have an external auditor. So was Sonny just an investor at Theranos as the Defence team had pointed out in their opening arguments. No, said Yam. She said, for example, all payments went through Balwani. She said that the company had zero revenues up till 2008, and by 2009 it was cash-strapped. Apparently on one occasion she and Holmes together had to call a customer and then ask them to contact Theranos Bank so that it would clear a cheque early and the company could pay its workers. As we also heard in the opening arguments, Balwani had lent $8 million in 2009, and we also heard that he got paid for this with 200,000 Theranos shares, which were valued at that time at $0.36 cents per share for his support. We saw the financial statements, obviously unaudited, showing that the company had burned through $161 million by the end of 2012. There were lots of details on this, but for me, a takeaway is that the company had just burned all its money for the whole of its existence, and at the end of it all, it had a device, or devices, the Edison machine and its derivative blood testing devices, that didn't work. What a waste. The company had had a weekly cash burn of about $2 million according to Yam, and Yam says that Sonny Balwani asked her to include Solgene and Walgreens revenues in its 2010 accounting statements, which were to be provided to the auditors KPMG. She said she refused because there was no paperwork and according to accounting rules, the revenues shouldn't be included. So just to explain this, to recognise revenue or income or sales in a set of financial statements, you need to have earned it. And there are very specific tests and rules you need to apply before doing so. For example, you can't just say, we have a contract and then say, ah, so we'll put all the contract revenue in the books and call it sales. It just doesn't work that way. Apparently, Balwani was, in quotes, frustrated about this, Yam said. We then looked at the financial projections, which were in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and Yam was asked what drove the numbers. Sonny's estimate, she had written in an email. Did Theranos ever achieve anywhere close to the 990 million in revenue that Sonny Balwani and Elizabeth Holmes projected? No, she replied. We then saw details of payments to Boy Schiller and Interfor International for work related to the whistleblowers Erica Chung and Tyler Schultz, and this was presumably for their harassment. Oh, sorry, that was my word. Presumably this was for legal threats, I should have said. We saw a familiar pattern as was demonstrated in the Holmes trial with texts between Balwani and Holmes being referred to to show that what they were privately discussing at the time of the events being referred to in court. Let's look at a couple. Balwani to Holmes. Let's put every ounce of energy into focusing on breaking even and getting to $15 million revenue per month in October, and every month after, a minimum of $15 million. Yam said Theranos was never cash flow positive, never met to that goal. Honestly, Balwani, with his idea of the company generating this type of revenue, and his forecasting was either deluded or completely divorced from reality. He clearly at least didn't understand the reality of the company's prospects, in my opinion. 
In 2015, we saw Balwani to Homes. I worked for six years, day and night, to help you. I am sad at where you and I are. I thought it would be better. I know you're angry in your way and upset with me for not doing everything you wanted me to do. Homes to Balwani. Question, question, question. Balwani to Homes. I am responsible for everything at Theranos. All have been my decisions too. I won't transition until you are in a perfect place. I think we'd had those texts earlier on in the Homes trial, but there were a couple of new ones. Balwani to Homes. This business, that's why the universe brought us together. Homes to Balwani. I know. Balwani to Homes. Without you, seems like the building is just an empty shell. Homes to Balwani. I know the feeling. So after the prosecution, we had Jeff Coopersmith up for Balwani on cross-examination. He gets Yam to acknowledge that she never falsified any Theranos financial statements. In other words, that Balwani accepted her pushback on the request to include revenues incorrectly. She reported directly to Elizabeth Holmes and Balwani put in long hours. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, which was at the end of play on Tuesday, so about midweek. We will have more testimony this week and I'll try and catch up for a Saturday video on week 5 part 2. But I do have a busy couple of days ahead personally. I hope you've enjoyed this update so far, so please like and subscribe. And if you hit the notification bell, then you won't miss out on future videos.